Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Horton, three-time Olympic medalist and world champion in track and field. Elaine thompson Hero has earned the respect she deserves. Her actions clearly demonstrate greatness. I must be honest. Coming up to this Tokyo Olympics, I was very concerned about how well Elaine's injury would hold up on the biggest stage of track and field. And also, would her past injury have a negative impact on her confidence and mental state in general? But one thing I was always sure about, and it clearly state, is that a healthy Elaine would be a force to be reckoned with. And in this case, Mrs. Thompson Hera was in tip-top shape and is well deserving of her monumental accomplishments. Hats off to you, Elaine. The facts are the facts. Elaine's performance is on parallel and is to be thoroughly celebrated wholeheartedly by us all as Jamaicans. In the world of track and field, records are set and records are broken. The beauty in track and field is that the players on the stage are ever changing as time travels. Nothing stays the same. Yet, the level of competition keeps rising. Isn't it amazing that a woman who rose from humble beginnings in rural Manchester has now achieved in track and field what no other woman has ever achieved on planet Earth? Elaine Thompson Hera has won not only the 100 meter sprint in spectacular form but also the 200 meter. Now she has attained the double double in back to back Olympics. This young lady has proven to the world that her and her team is now several dimensions above the current global competition. She is now well on her way to be considered the greatest of all times if she maintains this level of sprinting. Speaking of Elaine's team, but more specifically her coach and my friend Stephen Francis. If there is one thing to be said about coach Francis, is that he has a special eye for talented athletes and their untapped potential. The questions would be, what special sparks did he see in Elaine that other coaches did not see that caused him to recruit her? Did he recognize her greatness from the inception? How did he go about nurturing and developing this magnificent talent? How has he kept Elaine motivated for so long? And how will he keep her motivated going into the future? Bonus question. What is his secret formula? These questions are very relevant questions as I know many coaches would love to get a bird's eye view into the mind of the legendary coach Stephen Francis. He did it with Shelley and Fraser Price in the past and he has worked his magic once again, enabling Elaine to display the best version of herself. To say a job well done to Elaine and her team would be an understatement. Without a doubt, history has been indelibly made. My hope is for Elaine Thompson Hero to continue to consistently improve and in time achieve the triple triple at the next Olympic game which would make her undeniably the greatest of all times. Thank you for listening. I am Dr. Gregory Horton. Have a blessed day.
Hello. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Gregory Houghton here. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you all for being here tonight. Will be a very interesting night because we have a whole lot in store for you. I am looking forward to having the discussion with my special guest, the Honorable Juliet Flynn. So I look forward to that. But before we actually bring her into the studio, I just want to give a little bit of recap on what is going on in the sport. It's the Olympics. It's coming down to an end. We have a lot to give thanks for as our little country. We have been doing great things. We saw where there was a world record today. The U.S. finished 1-2. Sydney McLaughlin world record um that was impressive very impressive run i just want to take that time this time to send a shout out to, the, to Geneve russell she did a personal best 5308 you know remember um a few years ago uh, stephen francis invited me to come to a training session i was going to do an interview with him and i saw Geneve training and that was actually the first time i saw her run before but it was the first time i actually saw her in in training mode and i liked her from the start she seemed very focused and she seemed relaxed and i don't know i i, I was born november 10th she's born november 14th so i always get along with people who are born in november so i just want to tell her to keep her head up she has nothing to feel ashamed about it it took a world record in order to take away the medal that she thought she was going to have. I know sometimes we set goals and sometimes we set goals, but on that given day, someone is better than us. Also, I want to send a shout out to Rashid and Duaya because he too made the final, his first Olympic final. He finished seventh in the final, running 20.21. I think that is truly impressive. But the moment is for Hansel Parchment. He is now an Olympic champion. I knew he he has been through a lot. You know, he worked closely with, with his coach and my friend, Mr. Fitz Coleman. And I am so happy for them because, you know, it shows that when you're committed to something, good things can happen. But the bigger story is that we as a little country, we have a lot of talented people. And when somebody earns a spot, you always want to make sure that the spot is theirs. We also saw where Ronald Levy finished third. Very close race. And I'm sure he too must be pleased with what he won. So I just want to take my hats off to them. I also want to send a shout out to Nayoya, um, Natoya. You know, she ran hard throughout the rounds. And I knew it would take a little bit of toll on her, but she has nothing to feel ashamed about. She did well. She still ran 1 minute 58 seconds. Um, and I know that as she mature more, she is going to be better. You see, it took personal records and national records to throw her off medal contention. But at the end of the day, I just want her to still feel good about the work that she put in. For the 400 meters, we have two women who are in the final, and that is a good thing. Candice McLeod and Stephanie Ann McPherson. It can go any way. We have Alison Felix in lane eight, and I can promise you that Alison Felix is going to take it out. I'm not sure if she's strong enough to hold on but I promise you that she's not going to take it for granted and try to, to relax too much. Because when you have lane nine, you have to keep on going. I, I am cheering for the Jamaica by far. I hope they can upset the field. It's going to be hard because you have Shauna Miller there and she is going to be fighting. She's going to give her best effort. So um, I know they have their work cut out. They have been running consistently throughout the season, so I know that they're not going to come here and show that away. I also want to take a time to say congratulations to Christopher Taylor. 
because he made the final and I'm sure I saw he he made a post and he was saying in the post that it's been a long struggle. He appreciate what the team has done for him and he just want to give thanks. And I like that. I like when people remember the hard work, appreciate the teamwork. And this is why we are here today because we're going to talk to the minister and we're going to see how we can get some of these structures in place because she is she, she didn't just um, run for the country, she's also fighting for her people. And I'm happy that she took the time to be a part of what we have in store. And I look forward to talking to her. I wish we had more time, but I know that for her to be here, she's committed to making any form of contribution that she can make to make sure that track and field is in a very good place. So without any further delay, I want to welcome our special guest. We're going to play a video before we actually bring her in. We're going to welcome our special guest. She's very special to me because, you know, before she retired, I used to hang out with her. She used to share some of the stories with me. So I know her personally, and I know that she's a fighter. I know that she's a quitter. And just the same way how she's fighting, she was fighting when she was competing on the track. It is the same way she is fighting for her people and her constituency. And I feel honored to have her on this platform to share with us. So without any further delay, I am going to play a video and I'm going to introduce my friend, the Honorable Minister Juliet Flynn. Eight fastest losers through to the second round. Well, they were very unsteady, weren't they? Cuthbert got off well on this side, and so did uh, Samuel of Antigua in lane two. Cuthbert going well and finds the Bahama. Well, Samuel of Antigua, Cuthbert wins it. Samuel second, Hernish Nimi in third. They're the three qualifiers. 11.26. The time, a uh, trail wind of 0.4 metres per second, just to give you some indication of the conditions here. But uh, Juliet Cuthbert, very, very comfortable. Very Yes. Um, all right. So I welcome. I'm just waiting for honor. Okay. Let me just add her back to the screen. Hello. Hello. Honorable Minister. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I am so blessed. It is a pleasure to, to be talking with you today. Um, how are you doing so far in terms of the, the Olympic Games that, that we have? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm actually enjoying the these Olympic Games. I think it's one of the best mm -hmm. that I've seen, and I've gone to quite a few. <laughs> so um, the Jamaicans are doing very well. I'm very pleased about that. Mm -hmm. um, just to watch um, my countrymen and women performing just incredible on the track and also on the in the field events. I know we had a few disappointments here and there. But nevertheless, I think we're doing quite well. Yes, and I can't complain too. And, you know, I, I did a video earlier on. I was telling the guests or the spectators to take it easy because you have been through a lot when you used to compete. And when you have your low days, it's very low. And sometimes you feel alone. And, and I don't think sometimes the, the fans understand some of the struggles 
that we as at least go through, that we don't go out there with the intention to fail. We go out there to do our best, but sometimes our best just not good enough. Could you share some of your low times and how you were able to overcome some of these low times when competing for Jamaica? Um, you are right. Um, we don't go out there to fail. We train very hard. And um, as you said, the, the, I think the crowd, they expect a lot from the athletes, not understanding what they go through. Um, training for four years for one event or two events and then may not make it um, on the podium or may not make it to the finals. And so I think, um, you know, I think people are doing a lot of backlash, but I think a lot of people came on the athlete's side to say, hey, they've been training for a long time. They didn't come to fail, um, just cut them some slack. So mm -hmm. it is very difficult. And as you know, um, back in our time, it was even more difficult <laughs> for us Very much. As athletes um, to compete um, in the situations that we had to compete in. It was much harder for us. I think nowadays athletes, um, contracts are more easier to get yes. um, for athletes. Now they're leaving high school and getting a contract. And that was unheard of for us in our times. And mm -hmm. so I think it, um, people just don't understand the hardship that athletes face from time to time. And that is so true. So based on your perspective, though, uh, what are some of the high points and low points for you at this Olympic Games? I think some of my high points, of course, is would be the women's 100 and 200 meters since I was a sprinter. <laughs> um, definitely the hurdling events because I love the hurdles. Um, I've also enjoyed watching some of the other athletes beside the Jamaican um, Kirsten Warhorn, Varhorn, um, from, mm -hmm. um, um, Norway. And so I've really enjoyed watching McLaughlin in the hurdles and some of the other events that Jamaicans were not prominent in. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the low points of course is watching some of our athletes, um, Tajay Gale, um, um, receiving an injury. And having some of our athletes, maybe Johan Blake, not making it um, on. Uh, so, so, so those are some of the disappointments for me. And, you know, Honorable Minister, this is why I brought you on. And you can call me Juliet, you know. The, well, if, the you, if, if, if I have the permission to call you Juliet, I'll call you Juliet. Yes. So, so, so Juliet. I can feel. <laughs> Uh, sometimes you want to give credit when credit is due because you fight while you were running and now you're fighting for the people. So you hold a position that is it, it, it comes with a whole lot of responsibility. But I'll call you Juliet just for the time being. Yes. Um, the reason why I brought you on this platform because I realize that athletes, in order for them to be the best version of themselves, it's more than just running. Sometimes you need... Uh, a level of support, let's like say, for example, the Yuan Blake, Mr. Gale himself, they're going through injuries, they're going through um, some tough times, and that can lead to depression. I know that I was in depression, and I didn't even realize that when I failed to achieve my goal, I was in depression for a while. I didn't want to talk to people. I didn't want to go anywhere. And this is why I would like to see more be done to reach out to some of these athletes to to help them to cope because you know what it is like to have those dark days and nobody to turn to. Yes, definitely. And, you know, people are talking more about mental health. Um, we saw Simone Biles. We saw um, um, Naomi um, Os uh, Osaka. I, you know, people are talking about their feelings more now. And as you said, or the athletes back then, we didn't really have the support group. Um, maybe we're, we're, if we had some really close friends in the track and field fraternity that we would actually speak to them. But I think more um, has to be done, um, reaching out for athletes, because, um, you know, it's a different time. And the stress, I think, is a different type of a stress um, that the athletes are facing now um, with the, um, the, the contracts that they're getting, the obligations. Um, again, it was probably easier for us in a sense because we didn't have, some of us didn't have the contracts that we had to keep up with. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think the athletes, they need a support group. They need a, a, some sort of a network 
um, to help them navigate because sometimes they're coming up very young, getting these huge contracts and they don't have the persons around them to really help them to navigate. So I think it's very important that they have um, those people, are, you know, good people around them and the tools and the know-how to really help them to navigate. I think some of them, of course, they have the support group within their coaches and maybe, I don't know what the role the management team plays in some of these athletes' life, but I think it's very important to have some sort of a support group to help you along the way. Uh, you know, during our time, most of us usually go to the United States um, on a scholarship, not because the training wasn't wasn't great in Jamaica, but because of the support system that were available to us. We had good facilities, we had academic advisors, we had good trainers, um, chiropractors. There was a there were a group where even if we had injuries going over there, we would have a level of support there that we could could help us to get back on our feet. So, you know, sometimes people are struggling to say, should we stay, should we go? But you got a scholarship to, to come to the United States. Was it helpful for you? Did you regret coming to the States? If you could redo it, would you change what you did over the years in terms of taking that scholarship? Well, the, good, the, the difference between myself and I think some other athletes is I migrated when I was 16. So I was already living in the United States from the age of 16. And so it was easy for me to make that decision. And I think when I was living in Jamaica, what I wanted to do was um, I would have waited until, we all know Merlin Otto was at Nebraska, so they were thinking to possibly send me to Nebraska once my time came. And I, I was saying, I don't know if I want to go to Nebraska because I heard Nebraska was very cold. <laughs> it was. Um, <laughs> it still is. So, um, I don't think I wanted to go to Nebraska. So uh, my situation was a little bit different, as I said. So I lived in Philadelphia. And it so happened that, I don't know if you remember, Zele, um, Desmond Morris was a high jumper for Jamaica back in the day. Mm -hmm. And Zele and um, some other athletes um, were at University of Texas at Austin. And we had made the Olympic team together. And they told the coach about me and how I, there's a 16 year old that actually went to the Olympic games. And that is how I got recruited um, to go to the University of Texas. So it was a little bit different for me, but I think I would have made that decision back then in the 1980s to that where I would have migrated to come to the US because the track and field now, as we know it with the coaching staff that we have with Frano and Glenn Mills and the other coaches and Maurice um, and even now Shelly and Fraser's coach, those coaches were not around um, to say possibly take us to that next level. Mm -hmm. uh, we see where we, yes, they got us to the level of champs. I'm not sure if back then we had the coaches to really take us to the next level. While you were at Texas, did were there any structured program that helped you to develop physically and mentally? And if so, what type of programs were there? Yeah. Yes, definitely. University of Texas was a, is a very, was and is still a very rich school. Uh, and I remember in the latter part, we, we started talking about sports psychologists. Um, and they had sports psychologists to help athletes um, to go through whatever it is that they're going through. They also had study hall. So if you're falling behind in your grades, um, they, would, they had that study hall there that if you wanted it, that you would actually... Um, get into such a program uh, because as you know it's very difficult to study go to school um, and you know it's very difficult it's a full-time job on the track and it's a full-time job um, studying academically so they did have structures for you and as you mentioned if you got an injury they were going to take care of that injury because you were on that full scholarship and take care of that injury until you got better mm -hmm. uh, and so it was the the the, the, the support group is there for you once you go to a university in the US. I know some of the other athletes, of course, who possibly went to a junior college, maybe didn't have such great support system. Mm -hmm. um, it probably probably wasn't the same, but I think the colleges in America definitely give you a support system that you need, maybe better than some of the athletes staying here. 
um, in, in terms of making the transition from college, because college prepared you for the real thing, um, what strategy or support group that helped you to make that transition successfully? Because you, you actually made it to four Olympic Games. You won individual medals. You... Um, you won team medals. By the way, uh, one of the guests said to tell you that when he saw you pull up on the backstretch in 92, he, he cried like a baby <laughs> after senior. So he wanted me to tell you that personally, that you were the one that captured his imagination and, and allow him and caused him to love the sport like that. So I, I did my job. But <laughs> what type, how, how were you able to make that transition successfully from college into the professional? It was very difficult. It was very difficult. And I can call you Greg. It was very difficult um, for me. Um, my story, boy, I need to write a book. Uh, because after leaving um, university and, you know, winning, you're now the NCAA champion. And you had all these other girls who had came second and third. And it was now time to say, where am I going to go? What do I do next? Which coaching staff? Where do I go to coach, to find a coach? And when I went to, I ended up at, um, in California and it was a very difficult transition. I mean, I had to go find a job. I didn't have, um, I didn't have, being the NCAA champion now, coming out, I ran 20, 22 seconds low in the 200 meters and 11-0 in the 100 meters. And I wasn't able to get a contract. And so it was difficult. So I had to go find a job um, to work full time and train full time. And I did that. I had no choice. Uh, I remember at one point I had nowhere to sleep. I had nowhere to go. And it was Johnny Gray, the um, 800 meter runner from the United States who actually found a hotel for me, put me up for a couple of nights and then got a, per a family member of his to let me go and catch at that house until I was able to get back on my feet and um, move into my own space. And so it was very difficult to transition. And let me tell you, there were a few athletes who came to the same camp. That's the same camp, Merlin Otti with Chuck Debus, that where we were. And when they could not, um, when they found it difficult, as, as difficult as I was finding it, because I was roommate with one of them, and we were eating pork chops. Even now, I don't want to eat pork chops ever. <laughs> Too much I pork ate chops. pork chops with mashed potato, like every day it was pork chops and mashed because it was the easiest thing and the cheapest thing to buy and when times got so hard and she couldn't deal with it she decided to move back home to florida and then i was then left on my own to fend for myself and that is when johnny gray stepped in and helped me out and so it was very difficult i had to figure out do i stay here in california or do i move back to philadelphia with my parents um and I knew if I moved back to Philly, it would have been a no-no because I would stop training because it's so cold there. I hate the cold weather. And um, I decided to stick it out in California and made a transition. And it was very rough. It was a very rough, difficult time. But I, I think, as you said, you have to have that strength and that belief in, your, belief in yourself that you're able to do it. And I'd done so much before that that gave me that belief and winning the ncaa in the 100 meters and the 200 meters told me that hey you're the best in the united states of america and most people who are the best in the united states of america can always usually go on to win olympic medals and that is what kept me going you know in 2019 i came to jamaica and i did a tour i call it the mind of a champion tour and i went to 14 high schools and one of the purpose of going to the high school, I wanted to see for myself some of the, the, the challenges some of the younger athletes face. So I spoke with the administrators and I spoke with some of the parents and the coaches, look at some of the cafeteria and see how it was actually taking a little small cafeteria to fund the entire school. So I came, what I saw, I realized that most of the athletes they don't understand the ins and outs of track and field. And I consider them a part of a vulnerable population based on the fact that they seem like, you know, they're fending for themselves. But do you consider our athletes, for the most part, a vulnerable population? 
Um, again, because I'm so removed from what's happening, I don't know what's happening in some of the rural parts or some of the schools. And I'm sure, as you said, there are athletes there. You have the top and you have the ones who are making it to the next level and making it quickly to the next level um, where um, shoe companies are grabbing them. And then you have those who are on the fringe, not yet there and have the potential to be great and they are possibly struggling mm -hmm. um you know and that is where i think the alumni would come in or the schools would come in the coaching staff um would possibly come in so you know i i can't say i'm intimate with what happens in most of the schools but i'm sure that those are some of the things that's happening at this time um what do you think our athletes need on a whole to achieve greater success across the board in terms of our sport because you know i know that what we achieve is great but the amount that i think that are not able to to take advantage of the opportunity i think is greater so i, I i'm trying to figure out in your in your opinion what do you think These i think they, i think as you said more support i think there needs to be greater emphasis from maybe the J3A. The J3A is supposed to be developing. We're supposed to be developing our athletes and looking out for them and putting the things in place, the structures in place to make sure that they are moving from one space to the next. The schools are there to help them in that environment. But the J3A, as far as the youngsters, to build them and to put the right things in place, like as, you, as I think sports psychologists and the emphasis to take care of their mental, um, the physical need. I think more can be done when it comes to the physical need. And it's something that I've always spoken about. A lot of these schools may not be able to afford physiotherapists. And I've watched many athletes go by the wayside, um, fall by the wayside because they suffered an injury at our boys and girls champs or before and were not able to recover because they didn't get the proper treatment. Mm -hmm. And now, as you know, you compete at the highest level. You know what it takes, the massage therapy, um, the physiotherapy treatment. And, and these kids are performing at a very high level for us. Um, when you look at how the, the world is, champs is at one of the highest. When you look at the men's 100 meter, their boys are champs running 10-1. And so um, I think we need a more of a support system to be be in place for athletes to not just take care of um their you know running every day but their physical and their mental as far as their you know helping them with injuries and to prevent injuries mm -hmm. and also with their nutrition i think more emphasis should be placed on those things um if 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 emphasis are placed on those things who do you think would be best to take up that cost well, again, um, government can't take up all the costs, but I think this is where, um, for, for the schools, the alumni associations, I don't know, or the J3A should be able to play some sort of a role with the development because that is what they're about. Our in-sport is about creating that environment and creating um, the different sports in different communities. So I think it should be led, it should be a multi-agency um, a multi-agency approach, whether it's government on one hand or whether it's the J3A or the JOA um, coming together to pull together to form some sort of a support group for these athletes. You see, the reason why I ask that question, because most of the vulnerable population, if I say the athlete who are from, say, the inner city, and they, they are not able to afford some of these things. Somebody who has it, then they can make sure that their kids are taken care of. And if there's a deficiency, they can pay for that. But most of the time, these younger ones are put in a compromising position because for one, they don't have the information. They don't know where to go. Um, they don't have the money. They can't afford it. So I, I know it's, it's, it's something that Many a times we don't want to touch. But as you said before, you have seen so many by the wayside who have the talent, 
but they just lack that support and they lack the guidance. But here is one question I want you to think about, though. Based on your observation and your experience, what are some of the major deterrents that you find that prevent our athletes from fully developing while they're in Jamaica? Well, um, I think, you know, staying in Jamaica is not for everyone. And I, and I say this, after track and field there, you're going to have a life. Um, track and field only lasts to your maybe 28, 29, 30. You see some athletes just going into 32. Um, but I think some of the things that um, athletes need to focus on, even if you decide to stay in Jamaica, then make sure that you are going to a school uh, make sure you are developing in other ways. You're going to learn to, if you're making a lot of money, you have to make decisions as how you're going to save your money. And so you need those kinds of um, support structure. Um, again, we talk about the mental um, and the physical, but um, track and field only lasts for so long. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of these athletes need better guidance and, you know, the money dangling in front of them sometimes, yes, it's a great thing, but I think um, they need to possibly get better guidance as to what to do um, mm -hmm. and the decisions that they should make. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, three years ago, I was in Jamaica and I met with a few people um, who could make decisions. And I was saying that, we as a country that we need a national program that focuses on the mental you say that you use the term mental health um but we need a national program that can focus on helping people to make that transition because most of the time we focus on the physical transition but we don't spend enough time and we tend to push it uh, at the back burner to say that the mental is not important. But when you look at an athlete and see that they fall short in their event, most of the time it's not because of the physical talent why they fall short, but because of the mental issues that they may have, the lack of sleep, the lack of money, the lack of food, the lack oh, of the nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So do you think, based on your own observation, that a, 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 a national program is needed in order to help that vulnerable population to overcome some of the mental challenges that they are faced with No. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And I think the J3 had started such a program when um, Fudge was alive. I think they had started something at GC Foster. I was one of the mentors um, or person who went. They did it for teams, like if a team was selected to go to Carifta or junior team, they would have persons come in and talk to. But I think, as you said, maybe there should be a national program that is developed where athletes can actually reach out. And it's a continuous thing, not just when a team is selected, because these things happen all the time. Athletes will want to speak to someone on a regular basis. And so that is not there. That's not provided for them. They don't know where to turn, who to talk to. And so that is when that such a program would actually come in place. And the same way you'd have that program at a particular college or university that you're going to, there could be a, such a program because the, 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 um, the persons are here. Um, we do have the people that could actually assist with such a program. And so I think that is why I said the J3A should play some sort of a role, put in programs together um, for our athletes to look at their welfare. So that kind of welfare program where athletes need monetary assistance. Um, I know that I was one of those athletes who reached out to the J3A on several occasions seeking monetary assistance to help me with whatever it is, whether it was my rent um, because I couldn't make it um, or whether it was just for food. And so I think they already provide such assist assistance, but I think it needs to be more structured. And um, with that assistance should also be that mental health assistance when it comes to psychologists um, or whatever it is. And then you also put the physiotherapist, um, the, 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 the physical part of it. 
those things should be in place. And I would put that squarely at the feet of the J3A to provide such a thing or have the government put in some sort of a national program to provide that. You know, I, I, I've always believed that in order for things to get done, it takes someone to start the process. And I, I can proudly say that I am an advocate for the athletes because when you leave that vulnerable group to fend for themselves, you will see that they put themselves in a compromising position thinking that it is the best thing for them. We talk about the athletes getting contracts and many a times they really are not knowledgeable. And this is why I use the term um, vulnerable population because if you, if you lack a certain knowledge and awareness, you can't take the best contracts for you. You can't make the best decisions for you. Uh, and this is why if... If, say, for example, those in charge are not willing to put in place the physical, then they should also find ways to make the information available to us as athletes because it is the information that can help us to take a proactive approach to do some of the things that we need to do. But what can we do now as athletes since we see it's moving in a, in a direction where if we don't do the right thing now, uh, we're going to even fall behind. What can the athletes do, based on your opinion, that can help the those in authority to understand that this is something that needs to be done, like ASAP? Well, I think the athletes, we've all gone on our different paths, and we've been, so for me, shut out by the administration, if you ask me. Um, when I look at the United States, you see past athletes, Tanya Buford um, on the USA team. You see other athletes being incorporated in their team, going to Tokyo with the team, whether they're coaching staff or what have you. And I think that's probably something that needs to happen, um, where we you now incorporate back some of our athletes, our past athletes, into the system who's been there, done that, or that where they can, they, they can relate. And so I think some of those things need to be there, um, but then it depends on the authority if they want to listen or they want to go that route. Um, and so but I think if, if not, then they need to find other ways and means or other people to be able to um, get that information out to the athletes, whether it's by seminars, to teach them how to manage their money, how they make good decisions about contracts, to get that information there so once they're seniors and possibly getting ready or to make up their mind whether they're going to stay in Jamaica or go overseas or get a contract and become pro, then I think the information should be there for them, readily accessible for them to understand what they're getting into and what the, the choices are and what the, the consequences are for the choices that they will make. You know, I was at a... Uh, a conference with Bruce James from the MVP and he was telling the, the audience, we had people from Calabar and KC and, and all of those prestigious high schools and he was telling them that look, you guys need to get enough information because you think it's pretty out there but it is really a, a cutthroat thing. Now, I spend a lot of times, Juliet, with my kids trying to teach them some of the basic things of life. Uh, managing money, how to make decisions, and so on. And I can tell you, being a parent is hard. And many of these the, the, the individuals from the vulnerable population, they don't have that type of one-on-one -on -one where they are getting that level of leadership and guidance from somebody who they can trust. So it is necessary, because sometimes we talk about money in terms of helping the athletes to be better. But sometimes it's not really just that the money itself, but the programs that we're talking about. And I usually say, too, that I don't know what it is, but the, 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 the fraternity seems like they are afraid of us to, to have us associate with the, the new up-and-coming athletes because maybe they feel that we're going to share valuable information that may take away some of the control from them. But I'm about 
helping people to make the best decision because when you're in that vulnerable population, you tend to make decisions blindly. And when you make those decisions blindly, it always come back and bite you somewhere along the road, down the road. So could you shed any, at least who find themselves in those situations, what can they do to increase their chances that it won't um, deter them from what they set out to achieve, which is to achieve their goals? Well, I think, um, again, you know, you have to think for yourselves and um, athletes will have to find their, their way one way or the other. And so whether it's, it's through their management system, um, some of these athletes have publicists, they have managers, they have agents. Um, some of the agents will shed light as to how to manage your finances or how to navigate certain things. Um, I think, again, we, coupled with what a national program will possibly look like to help to teach and guide, um, then, you know, it would have to come down to the management of that athlete to actually provide um, such a guidance. But I think if it is that we can't, we don't want to depend on that to happen because that may not happen, is that's where the national program would actually come in where the J3 would have such a program where the, um, the athletes um, are getting valuable information, being taught to them some sort of a way where, I mean, now it's time for Zoom. Everybody have a phone, a, 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 a proper phone to actually get on Zoom. And since this pandemic, it has taught us another way that we don't have to gather a busload of students from the West and um, the North and the South and to come here into Kingston to have a seminar. They could actually put seminars together, get people like you um, one day to talk, get another. We have another, um, there's an ex-athlete who is now, she's a psychologist and to use those um, uh, um, persons or use a sports psychologist, put on a seminar. So you have persons talking about money, how to manage your money, persons talking about how to manage your mental health, Persons mm -hmm. talking about how to, for your nutrition. Persons talking about how you take care of your body. And so they could easily put on these things if they are thinking um, about the way forward and how to really move this country forward and help our athletes. Mm -hmm. And so it is very simple to really do. It's just going to take somebody to think outside of the box and not continue to do the things that we always do. And that is so true. I was talking to a friend recently and he said, you know what, Greg, if those athletes who finish boys champs, if they had two more years to compete for the school, that they would make sure that they take care of them. And I thought about it for a little because for the most part, we have a system in, in high school that takes them from seventh grade all the way up until they're 19 because they have an incentive to win. And I think that over the years, um, a lot of the investments that are made in helping the athletes to perform, it's done by other private individuals who just see a, a, a person struggling over there and just decide to help. And, 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 and these individuals know who no decide to help is not something that consistent and you don't know how long they're going to help or how far they intend to go so, but in terms of the transition again from the high school what other options do you think a high school person should have if they now decide that they want to make a successful transition what can they do who can they turn to is there a is there a group is there someone that they can say look let me Call such and such from a particular um, organization, and maybe they can sit and talk with me and get me on the right path. Or do well, they have to go to a club? Well, as we know, there's them? there's no such, there's nothing like that. There, I don't think any country has that kind of a setup. I don't know if any other country have that kind of a setup. I know Jamaica doesn't. I think athletes are pretty much you're pretty much left to even the pro athletes in America when it comes to basketball or what have you. Um, or pro football, it comes down to them making a decision as to are they ready to go pro or what's going to happen. I think they changed it in basketball a little bit um, where they can't just, they have to, I, I can't remember what the, the rules are, but I think um, 
it would just take the athlete to really seek that help on their own. Um, and I'm not sure if it is, as you said, it would be the organization of the J3 or the JOA to possibly provide such, um, you know, uh, knowledge to them. But as we know, there's nothing set up formally like that at this time for athletes to, to say, let me ask this person or that person what to do, what decisions to make. And so maybe that is also would be tied into what we're talking about. The psychologist, the massage, the masseuse or what have you, or the system in place where athletes can actually ask those questions. Um, you know, I'm thinking about going pro. I'm thinking about making a transition from high school and I want to either stay in Jamaica or not stay here. What's and at Nike or Puma came and offered me a contract. What should I do? Um, you know, my, and talk to talk to their parents or what have you. And then they may need that outside help to guide them, but that is not there. It's either they're going to ask a, an old athlete or because when you say it was going to go pro, um, at the time his manager came to me and asked my asked me what did I think. Um, of him going pro and so I gave him my perspective and what I thought and um, we saw where that led him he went pro but mm -hmm. um, again it's just it called, goes back to the management or the coach to talk to the athlete and then the, these athletes as you said they're they've started with these schools from an early age they are dependent on these coaches they trust these coaches so whatever it is that the coaches tell them, they usually do it. You know, um, and this is a tough question I'm going to ask you now. And you can say you don't know if you don't know. I saw somebody just put up um, a, a question. But I'm going to ask you my question first because I thought about it. I made some calls and I was asking around, is there any program that we have currently in motion that is that one person can say, I know for sure that this program is one that can help an athlete move from point A or point B or can help an athlete with some of the mental stress issue. Is there any program at all do you know of that is, 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 is there where the athlete can get any form of support outside of their high school or outside of the club environment? Well, again, I mean, I'm not aware of any program of any such program. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of any such program. Then again, I'm not that intimate with, as I said, with track and field and um, what's happening. Um, but I am i don't know of anything. If there was such a thing, I think I would know about it. But mm -hmm. I, I doubt that very much. Um, one question, the gentleman, his name is Donovan Taylor. He says, what about some of the tourist enhancement funds? I don't know what that is. Um, being yeah. made available to ISA and other sports development organization in Jamaica. I, I don't know what that is. Do you have any idea? Um, the Tourist Enhancement Fund, the TEF, that's from funding from tourism. I'm not sure. Um, I know that funds are given to us as members of parliament to do different development stuff in our constituencies. Um, that would have to, we would have to find out from Minister Bartlett. I'm not sure. But again, um, you know, I, I don't know how that would play in it as far as funds from their chases who gives funds to for track and field or for sports. And so chase is where the funding com get, comes from to, um, to the foundation. To, um, I, I, and so I don't, I think the best place to get the funding from would be from possibly chase that funds sports. Mm. So, so, and this is why, Juliet, we talk about access to information, access to, to knowledge, because, you know, in terms of if, if somebody wants access to these funds or to figure out what are the criteria? Oh, they are aware of, I think most athletes, they do draw down on these and they do write the foundation. Um, to, 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 to actually ask for assistance. They actually write the minister, Minister Grange, and she assist. We had a fund, I'm on a committee, or was on a committee, where we assisted athletes for 
So it's 12 weeks leading into the Olympic Games. So any athlete that we thought, and this wasn't just a track and field, we thought did not, all athletes who did not have a contract and they were possibly going to make the Olympic team that the ministry, well, the government assisted them and we were given, I think it's 200. I can't remember how much, Lord, and I was on the committee um, per month for, the, for 12 weeks. And so we were assisting with funding, um, I think it was 200 or so US or 300 US each month to help with the massage therapy and for food um, and for any other medical issue that they may have. And so I know that the government did assist with that leading into the Olympic Games, but it's not a consistent thing. Yeah. And it's only for one for years like that, a world championship year or um, Olympic year. And it's usually for about 12 weeks or so. Um, other than that, I know that youngsters do ask the J3A for assistance. And I know that they get it, but it's not structured. It's just willy-nilly. If somebody asks, then they give it. If, if somebody asks, they may not give it. So there should be a structure there as to who gets it. So it should be a tier system, I believe, and I've been asking for that for many years, where if you run a certain time or we think that you can make it to the World Championship or the Olympics then and you don't have a contract, then they should be getting X amount of dollar a month to help with their rent or whatever it is. Um, so I think more structure should be in this with the J3 playing that role and that's not happening and that is something that I would like to see happen. Mm. But um, there's no such structure at this time that I'm aware of. You know, Juliet, we are at a point now in, in the sport where we can't just make up the rules as we go along. We are at a point now where if we are to grow and to help more people then there must be a criteria where people know exactly that if I do this, then I will get this. Because, you know, what it sounds like to me in some instances is that you must be connected with a particular group in order to hear about these things. And if you don't hear about them, if you're not hanging out with the right group, you may not get the information. And if you can't get the information, then you can't act. And if you can't act, then you you just have to fend for yourself until you get there. But you know, it's a pleasure, Juliet. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I wish you would come back. Hopefully, we can set up another time where we can go into some some additional stuff, and then you can give us some insights as to how your constituency is doing, and just keep us up to date with your progress because it is a, it's not the first time I have an Olympian. But it's the first time I have a member of Parliament, Olympian, on the show. I really appreciate you coming, Juliette. And again, I, I, I can't say thank you enough. It's not a problem. It was my pleasure being here. You've been a friend for so long. We we're teammates for a very long time. And, um, you know, congratulations on all your achievements. And um, anytime you want me back, I'll come back. Just let me let me know. All right. Thank you very much. I think the next person we might need to get on this show is um, the Minister Grinch, because yes. I think that she would have a lot to share with, 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 with the audience. Because one of the things I'm truly trying to do, Juliet, I'm trying to make information available to everyone um, so they can at least see the signs and move towards that. So if you can tell the minister that, you know, I'm asking if she would be willing to you know, just give us 35 minutes. I'm sure the audience would truly appreciate that. Thank you very much, Julie. Not a problem. Anytime. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So, Bye-bye. So, um, as, it, as it stands now, as it stands now, um, I, I'm, I, I appreciate you all who are here today with me. We're going to follow up on this. Before you go, I don't want you to leave yet because for those who did not get to see that tribute to Elaine, we are going to play that tribute at the end. Um, about two more minutes, then we're going to play the tribute. But I just want to give my closing argument because I, I know that many of us, we love the sport. Many of us, we want the best for the athletes. But we don't have enough information to share with the athletes. So sometimes it's hard 
to help someone if you cannot give them valuable information, valuable insights, and also timely insights. And this is why I put together this platform. But in order for this platform to be successful, where those who are in charge can hear what we have to say, I am going to need your help. I want you to subscribe to the channel. I'll be putting out new content day after day. And I want to inform you all about the mission. Because no matter what we do, we cannot be successful if, if we don't have your support. And I'm urging you all to continue to be there with us, to continue to support us, because we want to put information in your hands. I really thank you for coming out. I hope that you will continue to support us. Um, on Sunday, we will have Megan Tapper, uh, the, the bronze medalist for the 100 meter hurdle. She has a lot to say. In fact, she is a mentee, have been working with Megan for some time. We're going to go into her mind because in order to get that type of performance out of her, I had to go deep into her mind and help her to focus. She's going to tell you more about it. Um, if she didn't bring it to the public awareness, I wouldn't say out loud that I am a mentor, but because she put it out there, I will just say that as well. So I thank you all for coming out with and, and, and spending the time with me and, and Juliet. And I really hope that you will just continue to support the channel. So for those who were late, we are going to play the tribute one more time. And I look forward to reading your comments in the comment section. So we'll pay the tribute one more time. Give me a second, let me find this tribute here. Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Horton, three-time Olympic medalist and world champion in track and field. Elaine thompson Hero has earned the respect she deserves. Her actions clearly demonstrate greatness. I must be honest. Coming up to this Tokyo Olympics, I was very concerned about how well Elaine's injury would hold up on the biggest stage of track and field. And also, would her past injury have a negative impact on her confidence and mental state in general? But one thing I was always sure about, and it clearly state, is that a healthy Elaine would be a force to be reckoned with. And in this case, Mrs. Thompson Hera was in tip-top shape and is well deserving of her monumental accomplishments. Hats off to you, Elaine. The facts are the facts. Elaine's performance is on parallel and is to be thoroughly celebrated wholeheartedly by us all as Jamaicans. In the world of track and field, records are set and records are broken. The beauty in track and field is that the players on the stage are ever changing as time travels. Nothing stays the same. Yet, the level of competition keeps rising. Isn't it amazing that a woman who rose from humble beginnings in rural Manchester has now achieved in track and field what no other woman has ever achieved on planet Earth? Elaine thompson Hera has won not only the 100m sprint in spectacular form but also the 200m. 
Now she has attained the double-double in back-to-back -back Olympics. This young lady has proven to the world that her and her team is now several dimensions above the current global competition. She is now well on her way to be considered the greatest of all times if she maintains this level of sprinting. Speaking of Elaine's team, but more specifically her coach and my friend Stephen Francis. If there is one thing to be said about coach Francis is that he has a special eye for talented athletes and their untapped potential. The questions would be, what special sparks did he see in Elaine that other coaches did not see that caused him to recruit her? Did he recognize her greatness from the inception? How did he go about nurturing and developing this magnificent talent? How has he kept Elaine motivated for so long? And how will he keep her motivated going into the future? Bonus question. What is his secret formula? These questions are very relevant questions as I know many coaches would love to get a bird's eye view into the mind of the legendary coach Stephen Francis. He did it with Shelley and Fraser Price in the past and he has worked his magic once again, enabling Elaine to display the best version of herself. To say a job well done to Elaine and her team would be an understatement. Without a doubt, history has been indelibly made. My hope is for Elaine Thompson Hero to continue to consistently improve and in time achieve the triple triple at the next Olympic game, which would make her undeniably the greatest of all times. Thank you for listening. I am Dr. Gregory Horton. Have a blessed day. Thank you very much for coming. May God continue to bless and keep you all safe. I mean fun can done.